so I'm Maya. Um, um, it's slightly confusing, I know I have actually two um, roles in life. Uh, one is that I work for Historic Environment Scotland. I'm a data information officer working on CAMO, which I do during the day. And then I go home at night and I work on this project in my spare time. Um, I manage it of my own. Um, but it's been a massive collaboration of lots of people contributing. So what I'm going to do today is, I'm afraid I'm not talking about Dunfermline, um, but I am talking about really old dead people, so hopefully that will still interest you guys. So, let's see. so where are we talking about? Um, I can't really get much further north than where the site was found. So just to clarify, um, the Akavanic Beaker Burial Project is researching the site of uh, an individual who died approximately 4,000 years ago um, in the early Bronze Age. Um, this individual has become known as Ava. The reason for this is that very few people can actually pronounce Akavanich. Um, I'm not even sure myself if that is the correct pronunciation. Um, and it's just naturally become shortened to Ava and that's sort of been picked up and people really like it. Um, so I'm going to be telling you Ava's story today or what we know of it so far. So Ava was found um, way up north in Caithness um, at a tiny little village, Akavanich. There's just a couple of houses. Um, and yeah, I think it's one of the most northerly um, known on the mainland. Um, though there, there are, I think, about 55 um, sites across Scotland where people have been buried with a beaker included, although it may be more than that. Okay, this is really strange, writing this way. We go. Okay, so um, I first found out about this site when I was working for the Highland Council Historic Environment Team. One of my duties was uh, to post to social media about interesting sites in the Highlands, um, and I came across the archive for this, um, and I thought it was fascinating. So I thought maybe I could do a little bit of research into it and see if we could find anything out. It's never been published, and it was never fully researched either. The problem was that the archive didn't actually exist. Um, in terms of site plans, we didn't have anything. We didn't have any notes about the excavation. All I had was um, about 30 photographs showing the original excavation and some um, pictures of the, the beaker, um, as well as um, some correspondence. So I kind of had an idea of who was collaborating on the, po on, on the, on the post-excavation side of things and some newspaper cuttings. And that's all I really had to work with. So the first thing I wanted to do is to do a site visit, and that was to go out and find where it actually was. And we had a rough idea, um, but I didn't know the exact spot. But I'm um, looking at aerial photographs of the area. I spotted this area where some quarrying had taken place right next to the road. <laughs> and I knew that it had been found during rock extraction for road improvement work, so I thought that was a good place to start. So as you can see, the photograph on the left, that was taken during the excavating, excavation in 1987. And on the right hand side is a photograph I took last year. And I hope you agree that it looks pretty similar. So I think that this is where, where the burial was found. So I spent a lot of time staring at those photographs um, and I managed to um, recreate the site plan. So this, hopefully most of you are familiar with site plans. Um, and you can see that this shows us um, the, the, the layout of the burial. The burial included, doo -doo -doo. come on, there you go. So the burial included the remains of what we think is one individual, um, a young female aged between 18 and 22 years of age. Um, one of the um, second things I did was to catalogue what we actually had. In fact, it took me um, a, a month or two to actually find out where the archives had gone. They'd gone to one museum which had closed and become another museum, and then closed and become another museum. And somewhere in that, it got moved to a different museum somewhere else in Caithness, and eventually made its way to Caithness Horizons in Thurso. So I went in and I recorded every bone, I measured them, I weighed them, um, and made a database which the museum are now using to um, preserve the remains. In addition to the, uh, the bones themselves, oh wait, yeah, sorry, these are the bones that we um, still have surviving. Uh, we did originally have the, um, the right femur, which is the, this bone in, sorry, this bone here. Um, but that was destroyed during the original radiocarbon dating process, which gave us dates for the early Bronze Age. Um, but um, I'm actually this week just about to take a second sample to Suik, um, the radiocarbon um, specialist here in Scotland, who are going to give us new dates, which will hope, hopefully be more accurate. 
come on. Yeah. So as well as the, the, the remains of the individual buried here, Ava, um, we also had what has now uh, just recently been identified of as the um, uh, shoulder bone um, of a of an adult but small cattle. Um, um, I hope you agree that the, the beaker um, has survived in an immaculate condition. It's, it's really quite astounding. It's very robust. Um, we have all of the pieces pretty much. Um, and the decoration is just beautiful. We also had um, three pieces of flint um, were found in the burial, but they've all since been lost, which is a shame. I have tried. I really have tried to find them, I promise. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do was try to try and figure out what position the individual had been placed in when they were buried. Um, so you can see the photograph on the left shows you the, um, the bones in situ. I've colour-coded them in the centre to give you an idea of which part of the bone uh, body is which. Um, the left leg, which is in dark purple, apologies um, if you are colourblind, I didn't think this one through, um, but the left leg um, is actually the highest point of the body. If you look, you can see it's above the spine in yellow, the arm in white, the hips in green, and the right leg in pink. So we think that this individual would have been laid in a position similar to this, um, if not with their knees closer to their, to their chin. Unfortunately, my model, who is in the audience right now, wasn't comfortable with me with tying her up to get her knees closer to her chin. So we'll just have to go with what we've got. Um, so I've done a reconstruction of the burial. Um, Doug, if you wouldn't mind, you could just click play on this screen. So we don't know... We don't know um, what their hair colour would have been, if it would have been blonde or brown. We don't know what their skin would have been like, if it would have been weathered or pale. And we don't know what clothes they would have been wearing, if they would have been wearing any clothes at all. Without any organic remains surviving, we just don't know. But one thing I will talk about in a moment is we are looking at getting, or we have actually, uh, are in the process of getting ancient DNA analysis done, which should hopefully confirm eye colour, hair colour, hopefully gender as well, and the ancestry of this individual, which um, we're very fortunate to have because only about 100 individuals across every time period in the whole of the UK has been sampled so far. So quite, quite exciting stuff. And looking at a broader context, um, Alexandra Shepherd has um, looked at burials um, primarily in the northeast of Scotland in Aberdeenshire um, and, and East Yorkshire. And what she's um, identified that there is a difference in the style of burial um, for male and female burials. It tends to be that men are buried on their left hand side with their head to the west um, and looking south, southeast. And women tend to be buried on their right hand side with their head to the west looking um, south southeast as well. What's exciting about this is that Ava fits into this model very well. Um, so it looks like we possibly have a trend that's um, happening from the very north of Scotland down to, um, to at least East Yorkshire, if not further. And one of the most unique but probably slightly boring aspects of this um, site, well, I think it's very exciting, but I can understand not everybody gets excited about holes in rocks. Um, possibly the young kid who's a geologist may find this exciting. Um, but this site is very unique in that I've only managed to identify a handful and I haven't actually seen any photographs of any other beaker burials where an individual has been um, put into a, a hole that's been cut into solid rock. And this is something that would have taken time and energy to create. Um, I, I will speak a little bit more about it in a minute when I get onto the collaborative research, but it's, um, it's quite unique and exciting. I'll explain why. Okay, so I've talked about the research that I've done so far, and I'm going to quickly touch on the collaborative research that I've been very fortunate to do with um, amazing, amazing people. Come on. Okay, the, the first, um, uh, one of my favorite aspects of this project is that I've done, or tried to do, engage a lot of people in, in the community. Um, I had thought maybe I'd get the local community uh, involved, but I now actually have people from all over the world who follow us. I have about three and a half thousand followers on Facebook, and about 500 of them are from Brazil. So I really need to learn how to speak Portuguese. Um, <laughs> so if anybody knows anyone who speaks Portuguese, please get in touch with me. 
But one of the best things was earlier this year, I was approached by the BBC who wanted to run a, a short piece, and that was picked up by the local Caithness Courier. They ran a piece that was saying that an archaeologist is looking for information. If anybody remembers anything about this excavation, please come forward. I was contacted on Facebook by a woman called Kathleen, and her father, Neil Sutherland, was actually the first police officer on site. Um, and this is almost 30 years ago, but even though he's in his 80s, he has a remarkable recollection of that day, and he wrote up a report for me of, uh, of what he remembers. Um, and one of the things that was never recorded by the archaeologists was where the beaker was actually positioned in the grave. But Neil remembered this. Um, he remembers the finder telling him that it was positioned just beside the head, um, which is fantastic. We wouldn't have known this um, if Neil hadn't come forward. Okay, osteology I'll touch on quickly. So this has been done by Angela Boyle, who's a PhD student at Edinburgh University. We know that this um, uh, was a, a Caucasian female who was about five foot six inches, so just a little bit taller than me. Um, for those of you who know about the cranial index, um, this might make sense, don't worry if it doesn't. It just means that she has a very distinct head shape. It's quite common to have something is looking down on the top of your head, um, and we, it's quite common to be short and round um, amongst the Bronze Age uh, Beaker people population. But Ava has a particularly distinct head shape, and it's raised a lot of, de of debates about whether this was natural and just something genetic to her, or if perhaps perhaps her skull was manipulated um, for some reason. What we do know is that between one and a half and two and a half years of age, she suffered from some sort of illness or deficiency. And that's um, by, we can tell by um, something called enamel hypoplasia, which is um, on your teeth. I'm not going to get into stable isotopes, so don't freak out if you don't know what this is. Essentially, it's a very, very clever way of managing to tell a couple of things from um, from the elements in, 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 in bones. Um, so Dr. Jane Evans uh, and her team have, uh, the NER NERC Geoscience Isotope Laboratory have carried out this research. It's been sponsored by, um, or given a grant by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. Oops. So what... Um, what we've done is uh, we've taken um, one of her, her back molar teeth and a sample of rib bone. And what this has told us is what you can tell from... I can't, I don't, sorry, I don't, I really don't have time to get into it. I could talk about it all day, but I won't bore you all. Um, essentially, um, the isotopes tell us that she had to be in a region that matches the, the two colours here. So she had to be in the green area on the east coast and somewhere in the yellow zones, which is based on the underlying geology. Um, there are lots of places in Scotland and even further afield into England that this could apply to, um, but based on the fact that we see both of these um, matching to the local area where she was buried, we think that she's probably actually grew up in the area. Um, and that's quite exciting because um, I, I'm not aware of anybody else who has been um, of this state who's been confirmed to be um, likely from Caithness. So she might actually be the earliest known individual from Caithness, which is quite exciting. Okay, uh, it also tells us about her diet. Um, the main thing that we know is she definitely wasn't eating any marine resources. She actually has one of the most extreme signatures um, to indicate this of any individual found anywhere in the UK, um, which is really interesting because she was buried only about two and a half hours walk from the sea. Um, but what we do think she was eating was freshwater fish. Um, um, based on the fact that there's the cow shoulder bone found in the burial, um, probably cattle, um, and also um, we think they were growing crops. <coughs> so one of the biggest things, one of the main things that happened and something that made this project go global was um, a forensic reconstruction done by a graduate of the MSc course at um, University of Dundee, Hugh Morrison, who did a fantastic um, a reconstruction of Ava. Uh, again, I don't have time to go into how he did this. If you want to find out, come and have a chat with me downstairs. Um, but this went absolutely global. On Facebook alone, I think it reached about 50 million people. Um, my name was was everywhere when I googled myself. It was just I was I, in languages I I don't understand. I, I can't even identify what languages they were. Um, 
And it was, it's just been picked up um, and run with all over the world. We were on the Smithsonian website and National Geographic, just everywhere. And you have to remember that this is just me um, and, <laughs> and Hugh, who uh, was completely overwhelmed and not expecting, he maybe thought maybe 100 people would be interested, but millions of people wanted to know more. So that was very successful. Um, I've been working with a guy called Tom Booth, who a, has a PhD in mummification in the Bronze Age. Um, he's done something called bone histology and has done a CT scan of Ava's, um, Ava's skull. So this is a cross-section through, through the middle of her skull. And you can actually see that um, one of her teeth never came through. Um, and this is something that uh, she probably didn't know about herself, but here you are 4,000 years later and all of you know. Um, the bone histology... Um, what this, what bone histology is looking at is looking at the rate of bacterial decay in the bones. So um, the bacteria in your gut breaks down your bones. Um, and if, um, the batch, if the body is naturally decomposing, we tend to see it, it, it happens extensively. Is what we can see at, um, at, in Ava's bones. So she's the one in the middle. And just to give you an idea, on the left and right, these are from two other sites in Scotland where this process has been stopped we think that they've probably been mummified or exhumed in some way. But at Ava, um, clearly this hasn't happened. What's interesting about this is I mentioned um, the rock cut pit earlier. Now, the rock cut pit would have taken time to create. And if she was buried, what this um, suggests is she was buried very soon after death, but it would have taken them t time to create the pit. Did they, ma did they know that she was going to die and then they had it prepared before she died? Or was there a surplus of um, kiss created in advance of people dying? Or maybe there was a family plot and she just happened to be the last person buried there. All raises more and more questions what you find out. So that's all of the research we have back so far, but very quickly I'm just going to tell you what we're currently doing. Um, so if you are interested, you can follow us and keep up to date with what we find out. At the moment we're doing pollen residue analysis, and um, this is by Dr. Scott Timpney at UHI. Um, and although Scott hasn't actually identified the pollen yet, he told me last week, which I'm very excited about, that there is some pollen surviving from the inside and potentially from the outside of the beaker as well. So this will hopefully tell us about the contents when it was um, placed in the kist and maybe about the surrounding environment. Um, we've been approached by... Um, as alongside the Caithness Brock project um, to collaborate with Rock Rose Gin, and they want to do a gin inspired by... Um, so I'm very excited about that because I'm a big fan of gin. <laughs> and as I said earlier, we're also doing ancient DNA analysis. I don't have the results for this. I wish I could share them with you today, but we're hoping in the new year we'll find out more. What I do know is that we have got a sample um, I've been told that something like 29% of the DNA has been extracted, which doesn't sound like a lot, but um, considering how old um, this is, uh, this site is, and considering that um, some we don't even get 1% from, um, it's actually the best sample that um, from this test group that was taken um, from any Bronze Age individual. So it's very exciting, and I, I hope that I'll have exciting things to tell you in the future. Um, and just for interest, um, all they need for ancient DNA sample is you see that tiny little hole in the skull. That's it. That's all they need. This tiny little sample. And it's just, it blows my mind that that much bone can give us so much information. Um, again, radiocarbon dating. I'm taking the sample over this week, um, and hopefully this will give us more precise dates. Um, again, very exciting. Um, yes. Okay. So my lessons learned. Um, Having worked on the Highland um, HER database and now on Canmore, I can confirm that there are thousands of sites out there that could really, really do with some TLC and attention. You don't have to go to the extreme lengths that I've gone to, but um, go out and look at these sites or find assemblages that nobody's looked at. I can guarantee that even in the National Museum of Scotland, there will be boxes that nobody's looked inside of for hundreds of years. I am what I like to call a visual archaeologist, as you've hopefully told from my slides, I really like drawing things, and um, that's how I work. Um, I was a little bit scared of doing this to begin with, because it's not really what people do um, in archaeology. We're, we're very much textual-based, we type everything out, um, but I like to draw it, so that's what I do. And I was afraid that I might get criticism, but I've received nothing but um, a positive feedback. So. 
if you do something differently, don't be afraid to do it, and don't be afraid if it works. We can't know everything as one individual, um, and I think what this project demonstrates is what we can do when we collaborate with each other um, and also engage. I think I'm doing a research project that would probably normally be done by academic institutions um, or commercial um, bodies um, or museums, but um, I think that they are more restricted in what they're allowed to tell people during the research process, and fair enough. But I've had such amazing feedback from um, the people that follow me uh, on social media and the comments and feedback that they give me are actually helping to shape the research and where we go next with it. Um, so uh, I, I'm hoping that this will go online and they'll get to watch this. So hi guys, thank you very much um, for, for following and for all your feedback. And lastly, if you want to do research, then do research. Um, I do have a, a research master's, so I do have a slight advantage there, but you don't need to have a PhD to do research. Um, if there's something you're interested in, then do it. Go for it. You never know what's going to happen. Um, if you want to follow us and find out more information about the project, I have some leaflets downstairs. Please grab them. We have a, a website, and as I said, we're on various social media channels. And lastly, I just want to say a quick thank you to all of these people that have helped. I wanted to put Archaeology Scotland on, but I forgot. I apologise. I just want to say thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. It's a great honour to be here. Um, and yeah, thanks to all these people for all of their hard work as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.